Okay, here we are back with Okinawa from Tiny Battles Publishing. Um, I'm going to go through Japanese movement phase, Japanese reserve phase, and the Japanese combat phase and end phase in this one video. Hopefully, to wrap it all up, and that this series of videos gave you at least a brief look at the game and its systems and how it comes together and how the game is played. I did not cover any of the air or naval aspects of the game other than um, a little bit of air and naval support but there is a whole rule section on how aircraft interact with uh, naval units and that type of thing. So, For those of you who do purchase this product you will discover that on your own and hopefully it will add to your enjoyment of the game. Like I said, this is just a brief overview of the game, um, showing you a little bit about how the game plays. So, without further ado, we're going to move on to the Japanese movement phase. There's not going to be much the Japanese player can do, however, there's a couple things that he will need to do according to the special rule, well not special rules, according to the, um, what was it called? According to command and control, I think it was something to do with the uh, Japanese command and control. I had to roll on a table, and that table indicated that we had to make a counterattack with at least two regiments, or else the game is an automatic win for the U.S. player. So, <clears throat> with that in mind, the unit uh, Japanese 60, 63rd unit. Um, I think it's going to pull back one hex because I still have a couple of Japanese units here which can move into position to make attacks. Now, do I have to attack the same unit or different units? I just, I think I just can attack with, uh, have to attack with two units. Let's see, to launch a counter uh, counteroffensive in this turn, the Japanese must attack with at least two regiments. Only one counterattack per month is mandated. So I think all I gotta do is make one attack with two uh, regiments. So if that's the case, let's see here. Three, four versus this eight. It's going to be pretty much a suicide attack, it looks like to me. And a three, four. So the most we can muster is a six. Um, yeah, so anyway, to show how this would work, well, I could actually attack with three regiments, but either way, it's going to be pretty much a, a no win situation. But maybe we can do it. We'll see. Anyway, we're going to move this Japanese unit. There's no movement point penalty to leave a zone of control. However, there is a plus one to enter an enemy zone of control. However, we're going to take the road for half a movement point. One plus the one to enter the units, the enemy unit zone of control. And here, we're going to leave the fortification. And we are going to move one hex ah these counters so sticky um, one hex to the north and although I wouldn't do this in a regular game because this is just bad strategy but we had a kind of a bad roll I guess we will move well Japan is the only unit is the only player who can infiltrate so for a cost of an extra plus one. I think we can move there for two into the rough. I think that was three, so that would be five. Let me double check infiltration movement. We can move zone control for an additional one. So, yes. And that's going to bring up combat with at least three, well, two Japanese regiments and a regiment, uh, a brigade. So, that's going to pretty much be that. Um, I don't really see any other 
necessary movement at this time, but I guess since there are no landing beachheads here, or no landing, yeah, beachheads, I guess we could go ahead and take these naval, uh, what are they called? NBF, something for naval space something. I'm not sure what they're called. Anyway, we'll move them into the city here. Across the bridge. Uh, let's see, I guess we'll put their little fortress back. I think they're fortifications. And I think we'll leave a unit here. Just to cover that air base. And um, there is an invasion beach here. We land here. I really don't want to uncover that unit. And the 32nd um, Army Command is under there, protected by two units. And I really don't want to do anything with it at the moment. I think the Japanese units oh, could probably pin the Americans and keep them, or I could. Well, I guess I can always. Uh, the 32nd Army can be deployed or it can be in moving uh, mode. I know that's not going to show up very well, but we all have to do this in at least one video. We have to try to get something in focus so you can believe what I'm saying. Anyway, and that would be at the beginning of the movement phase, I believe. In moving, its command radius is... I think a two, yeah, there's a two on there, so it must be two, which means any units within two hexes of it um, can do what? What can they do? It either has an eight or two command range. Um, I think it has something to do with command control. That makes sense. Um, Japanese reserves. I think it has something to do with the Japanese reserves. Anyway, they're not being used on the first turn, so I'm going to switch it over to moving and see if it can indeed move at this point. Because I'd like to pull it back, although it does occupy a victory point hex. And it's actually one that they need, the American player needs so I don't think I'm going to deploy it to its moving side. It looks like it has a five for its range. We're going to keep it deployed and just keep it sitting there for now. Okay. It looks blue on the screen, but the token is actually green. All right, that's going to be it for the movement phase. Now we have the Japanese reserve phase, of which there is none, then the Japanese combat phase. And we get to go to combat. There will not be uh, any artillery or anything like that on the Japanese side. The combat is going to occur against this uh, infantry unit and the tank beneath it. Or, is that a tank? No, the amphibious uh, armored unit. So it's only going to give a one die roll modifier, it looks like. Anyway, we're going to go ahead and c compute the odds real quick. We're going to have a two, three, four, five, and a six, seven, eight. So that's going to be eight to eight. That's going to be one to one. We will use... Well, I guess my best bet is to use this unit here. Uh, efficiency, efficiency rating of four versus its four. So this will be the lead unit and this will be the lead unit. So I have eight to eight. We have zero efficiency modifiers. The American player does get a plus one for the amphibious unit. And the American player can throw in two artillery units if he would like. And he will. He has plenty of artillery. And the defender can always put in two. Uh, uh, Support always gets me confused here. One asset per involved attacking unit. And the defender cannot use more than two artillery units per 
defending him, so uh, he can use two. So basically, be two artillery units there with four more. So that makes a five. Dyro modifier plus five. At one to one, we'll roll the die. There should be no other modifiers. This does uh, count as the counterattack by the Japanese player. We roll a one plus five on the combat results table. Was there any terrain modifier? I don't think so because I think he was well. He's in the rough. That's one to the left, so it's a one to one attack with the die, or one to two attack with the die roll of one plus five is six. That's a one D one R. So I don't think we have to worry about the Japanese unit because the lead unit is destroyed with the one. The one result, that's a step loss of one. The American unit gets a step loss. And let's see, that was six on the one to two, and a retreat. Well, he can retreat, the artillery goes away. Um, he can retreat back, he'll retreat back to here, along with the tank will also retreat with him. Or the amphibious unit. Amphibious tank is what they're called. Let's see if I can make this a little prettier. I know the tank is not dead. So he retreats back into Ushita Mari. And I will not advance because it would not do me any good to do so. Because there's a huge open area. With more US units coming down and advancing into this hex would serve nothing to uh, um, help defend any potential second landing. All right, and that is the end of the Japanese combat phase. We would have reserves, but there is no reserves, or there are no reserves. Well, I already said that. Reserves come before combat. My bad. Okay, the Japanese combat phase is over. We go to the end phase where we remove status markers like disruption, stuff like that, and advance the game turn marker to the next turn, which would be game turn two. Um, in this scenario, you have turns one through four. There are some American reinforcements coming on on turn two, but I'm going to go ahead and call it right here because I think this gives a fairly decent example. And yes, I removed everything up here. Um, a fairly decent example of how the game plays and what the components look like and get a general idea of gameplay. So, with that, I'm going to go ahead and end this video series. And I'll try to think of what to do next. May do just a couple, couple or several, uh, I guess you want to call them, you can call them unboxings. They'll basically be just take a look at, you know, show you what's in them, show you the components, that type of thing. Um, Centurion's review does a good job of that, so I may try to emulate his um, format and uh, just do a short little videos on, you know, what games look like, what I have, my library, and that type of thing. This will allow me to actually get in some real game time on other games that I've been wanting to play, but not really film. So, without uh, any more rambling, I hope you liked it, and I will talk to you later. Bye.